Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at Chapter 3 of Grievers by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, same content heads up as the previous chapter, but do know that this chapter has uh, some abuse in it as well. And as always, let's open up with a passage. Whatever had taken comma was now a month old, sliding through the streets, swallowing people from their wakefulness. It was becoming normal to find people standing still in the middle of a sidewalk or street, grocery aisle, or sitting in a running car, their faces contorted with some personal, mysterious agony. Their lips whispering random words, bodies rocking. Dune wanted to care, but she found that she couldn't process the scale of loss. And so, in chapter 3, uh, which is one of the longest chapters of this novella, we learn more about Dune's family's history, the disease spread, and Dune's own grieving. A warning, because the chapter is so dense, the summary won't be able to cover it in great detail. It already kind of feels a little bit like a summary of a summary, so bear with me. Um, we do learn that Mama Vivian, not to say, I'm not saying it's bad writing, uh, just that there's a lot of info covered, right? Um, we learn that Mama Vivian came to the city as an organizer and that Brendan, Dune's father, was from a previous marriage. Mama Vivian remarried Wes a fellow organizer from the city. Because of her experience, Mama Vivian was often called on by younger people in the community for wisdom. We also learn that Kama grew up in an abusive household and was initially set up in an arranged marriage before she fell in love with Brandon and became pregnant with Dune. Uh, Brandon was a studious organizer concerned more with reading and functionality while Kama had a more spiritual orientation and kind of likes to decorate by feeling. Um, she kind of is in charge as far as uh, house uh, upkeep goes, I guess. Um, although they do work together, it's, it's pretty clear from the text. Like Vivian and Wes, uh, Brendan and Kama met while organizing. While we're learning Dune's family history, we also get glimpses of the disease and the response to the disease, or H8, um, the syndrome. We learn that it's only present in black people and by the end of the chapter has affected 10% of the city. Hospitals are no longer taking people, instead choosing to leave the affected abandoned in empty buildings with only volunteers to feed them broth and change diapers. Um, the conditions are not great. Um, it's described as like wind coming through the windows and stuff, and um, they, they're effectively abandoned. Citywide curfews are put in place and limits are set on entering and exiting the city, and Dune's neighbors choose to leave while they're able to. So... As we learn more about the disease, a stronger parallel forms between this work and Jose Saramago's blindness. Not only in that the disease spread seemingly untraceably, but also in that the response of the officials to block off the disease as quickly as possible, right? They're really not, um, it's kind of very much a quarantine approach, which is reasonable with a new disease, um, but in both works we really kind of see the cost of those who are trapped inside with it, or kind of how people are abandoned inside this system, right? Both works also place a heavy emphasis on community support as an alternative to such measures or a way to survive such measures. This chapter also highlights the importance of intergenerational wisdom, not only Mama Vivian's role for more spiritual wisdom, but also Gerald, uh, Gerald, sorry, <laughs> Gerald, her neighbor, um, Gerald, um, Gerald, her neighbor, who does his best to support Dune in the way that she needs. Gerald focuses on giving her distance as she needs, not only emotionally, but physically as well. Uh, keep in mind that he's also giving distance in case Dune is possibly infectious in some way, right? Um, let's see. While others may be calling on her and questioning her, the introverted Dune is grieving quietly, and Gerald, pr Gerald provi sorry, provides her with information, a meal, and a bit of conversation. Um, so one of the big questions of this chapter is about intergenerational wisdom, right? How is it passed down? Is it always positive or can intergenerational wisdom be negative too? And as always, cite the text and any other sources to support your answer. Um, this is going to be my final video on um, this book for a while. If you like it, let me know and I'll do the rest of the chapters. Um, but otherwise, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you're liking the book so far and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.